My prayer for 2023, this is my personal prayer. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and take it as yours, too. It's very simple that I might see him more clearly. And then I will love him more dearly. And then I will follow him more nearly. That I would see him more clearly, you know, when you see him clearly, you can only the only thing left to do when you see him clearly, the only reflex, the only response, the only outcome is to love him dearly. When you see him, the more clearly you see him, the more dearly you'll love him. Because he is love. And the more you love him is because the more glimpse that you have of him, the greater glimpse you have of him will result in the greater love that you have for him. And it will result in the greater closeness that you walk with him. I want to be so close to him. I want to hear his heart. I want to hear his. His pulse. I want him to hear mine. It's my prayer for this year. Lord, that I might see you more clearly, that I might love you more dearly, that I might follow you more nearly. There is no other life better than that. There will never be. Because when we get to heaven. We will see him more clearly when we get to heaven, we will love him more dearly when we get to heaven, we will follow him more nearly. So I'm starting that right here, right now. And it all starts with seeing him more clearly. We have been. The the true. Jesus, the true God, what he truly looks like has been vandalized by religion and religious versions of a God who calls himself our father. A God who Jesus said when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, pray like this. Our father, our father, Jesus is so inclusive that he the first thing he says to pray, the first way, the first entry point, the first picture that God wants us to have of him is as father and not just any father, but our father. We have the same father as Jesus has. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he said to one of the disciples, he says, go and tell the others that my God is your God, that my father is your father. Go and tell them this is what we've come to bring to this world, the word of reconciliation, that the world has been at war with God. And since Adam and Eve, mankind has been at war with God and God sent Jesus to reconcile us back to himself and did all the work himself. And he's given to us as believers the ministry of reconciliation. Our life is here on this earth to bring peace between God and man, to introduce man to a God who offers peace and reconciliation at the expense of his own son's blood. And now we bring that reconciliation. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. We're ambassadors of the gospel representing what Jesus has done. We are not bringing we are not telling people a message of what they must do. We are announcing to them what God has done, offering peace to mankind. It says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Woo. And if if Jesus is enough. To satisfy the father, if Jesus blood is enough to satisfy the father, then it's good enough for me. If all God needs is the blood of Jesus to whereby we can come boldly to the throne of his grace, then that's all I'm ever going to go to him on the basis of. I want you to lean in. This year, starting today, we're going to lean into our destiny. We're going to lean in. When you, you know, when on, the, on certain. Apparatus, whether it's a bicycle or other a motorcycle, other vehicles, you can where you lean can determine where you're going. 
And I really believe that we have an opportunity in this season of our lives to lean in to our destiny, not sort of casually hope we bump into it, but lean into it. When you lean into something, it's deliberate. When you lean into something, it's because it's good and it's something that that you can rest your weight upon leaning in. I want you to lean in this year to just see this just picture of of yourself leaning in to your destiny. And in Hebrews chapter three, verse 13, it says, encourage one another daily. As it is called today, I have some things I want to share with you about that next time. But he says so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Listen what he's saying. Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. Is today today? Is tomorrow today? No, but it will be tomorrow. Tomorrow will be today. And he said, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. And he says, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, what sin is he talking about here? Certainly, he can't be referring to every particular sin in the world. That's impossible to be that specific here. We have to understand what he's truly saying based on the context in which it's put and which it's said. And so what sin verse 12 tells us, if you go back one verse, it tells us what sin it says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. The sin, the sinful heart that he is defining here is the unbelieving heart, the sin that he's talking about that keeps people in the wilderness and out of the promised land is unbelief an unbelieving heart that causes you. It is the unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. A, a believing heart turns to the living God. An unbelieving heart turns away from the living God. The sin here is turning away from God. It's not that you had one too many glasses of wine. It's not that you cussed somebody out. Which I must recognize and just brag about. I haven't done that in a week. <laughs> the sin is not believing in the goodness of God, not believing in who he says he is. Whew. What happens? Hebrews 3, 17 says, and with whom was God angry? With whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? What sin tells us in verse 12? The unbelieving heart. Are you sure that's what he's talking about? Well, if you go, he says, verse 17, with whom was he angry those 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? What sin? Unbelieving heart whose bodies perish in the wilderness. How do we know he's talking about an unbelieving heart? Verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Boy, if we can get a hold of what sin really is to God, to, to, to us and to man, we know what sins are. We know this is a sin. That's a sin. This is a, we know gossip is a sin. We know, you know, we know going angry, going to bed angry is you could call that a sin. We know. I mean, do not lie. Do not see. We know what sins are. But that is not what causes what caused these people to perish in the wilderness. What caused them to perish in the wilderness was their unbelief, having seen the mighty works of God, having seen the ten plagues, having seen God open the waters, having seen Moses part the Red Sea, having seen so many miraculous, glorious things that could only be ascribed and attributed to a mighty and almighty God. They had unbelief. They refused to believe 
his promises that he would deliver them. And that is why they ended up stuck in the wilderness. And of the 600,000 men, mind you, that were over 20 years old, not including the women and then the children, but just the men, 600,000 of them began a journey to cross and to go in from the wilderness into the promised land. And only two of them made it through Joshua and Caleb. And the reason why the others did not enter in is clearly and poignantly described and declared here. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So we say, what is unbelief? Unbelief is to try to undo. It's to undo what God said. It's to unbelieve. Like God said, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to hold you. I'm never going to leave you, forsake you. And you live a life in continual question and skepticism of that promise that God made to keep you and be with you and not leave you or forsake you. That is what unbelief is. Now, the reason why people go to hell, why would a loving God send people to hell? A loving God doesn't send people to hell. But people send themselves there by rejecting the only means of substitution for our sins in every culture, in every country, in every city, in every family, in every bit of history. There is always a justice system. Sometimes that justice system is good. Sometimes that just justice system is bad. And for the for the countries that we that we that have existed in this world since civilized mankind, most countries have been a mixture of good and bad in the justice system. Even in America, as good as it might be to most people in the world, there is some injustice in the justice system. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, you can say amen. And it's OK to admit it and still love America. But with God, there is no injustice in his justice system. There is only justice in his justice system. And therefore, every sin must be paid for because it is an offense against a holy God and a holy God who is in him. There is no darkness. That holy God cannot and will not ever be able or be willing to or it's impossible for him to exist or it's impossible, I should say, for us to exist in his presence with sin in our life. And you could try from today until the rest to into eternity to try to get rid of all the sins in your life, but you will fail because you cannot get rid of them from your human flesh. But Jesus takes it all away. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That and, and saying, I'm not I don't believe that that is the unbelief that will send somebody to hell. They will send themselves there by rejecting the justice that has been offered to you. It can be your it can be yourself crucified for your sin or it can be Jesus. I'm going with Jesus. Why should I do what he already did? And it won't even be sufficient. But what he did was fully sufficient once and for all time. He, he will not ever come back to die on the cross again. He will not ever make another sacrifice for your sins ever again. There is no remaining sacrifice for sin. That means in Hebrews when he says there will no, there is no remaining sacrifice for for sin. He's saying you you can't get to a place where you lose what you had because there will never be another one offered for you. So you must lean into the one that was already given. He said they died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. So there's two levels of unbelief. There's the level of unbelief in rejecting Jesus. That unbelief is what sentences a person to have to pay for their own sins with their life for eternity. By accepting him, your home, your home forever, your home. Religious people don't want to hear that. They'd rather hear, hear you say, no, no, don't say that, because then people will take advantage of it. It's meant to be taken advantage of. 
I'm taking advantage of the blood of Jesus by 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 having peace for the rest of my life, knowing that my sins are forgiven and he is my Abba father from now into eternity. All the other confusion around that gets worked out when you are in an active relationship with God. It's all about relationship. But the other level of unbelief is the unbelief that people remain in unbelief about the goodness of God, unbelief about his love, unbelief about the closeness that he invites us to. So they remain in the wilderness, though saved. Many believers remain in the wilderness. And you know what the wilderness is? It's it's defined in the Bible. The wilderness is the dried up. Uninhabitable places, uninhabitable places. You can't really live in that. It's not a livable place, even though people live there. It's 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 not meant to be lived in in the wilderness. It also means dried up. And listen to this. It is the abode or the home to abide in. It is the abode of jackals, ostriches and wild asses. I quote you word for word in the Hebrew language of this word wilderness. The abode of jackals, ostriches and wild asses, if you are in the wilderness of unbelief, you are either a jackal, which I don't know what jackals do. You're an ostrich. I know ostriches put their head in the sand and they deny reality or wild asses. And we all have someone in our life like that, right? (laughs) If you want to come out of that, like, man, 2023, no more wild asses, no more ostriches, no more jackals in my life. (laughs) Hallelujah. You want to come out from the wilderness. Who is the one who will come out from the wilderness? Song of Solomon, chapter eight, verse five tells us who is this coming out from the wilderness, coming up from the wilderness? Who is it? The one leaning on her beloved. Who's the one coming? Some people are going to stay in the wilderness. Some people are going to come up out from it. Who's the one coming up out from it? The one leaning on her beloved. It's time to lean in. We lean into our destiny by leaning into our belovedness. Oh, if I could get this across you, we 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 come out of the wilderness by leaning into our belovedness. We come out of the wilderness by leaning into our belovedness. We come out of the wilderness by leaning into our belovedness. We come out of the wilderness by leaning into our belovedness. People, we come out of the wilderness by leaning into our belovedness. When we lean in to our beloved relationship with Jesus Christ, who has shed his blood, not just so that we wouldn't go to hell, but so that we could have a relationship with God and have intimacy with God, because the the birthing place of your destiny is found in your identity and in your intimacy with God. The birthplace of your destiny is found in your identity and your intimacy with God. What is your identity? You are the beloved child of God. You are his beloved. You are his loved. Who is the one coming up from the wilderness? The one leaning on her beloved. Jesus is our beloved. And when we lean into him like John leaned into him and he put his head up on Jesus bosom, then when no none of the disciples knew the answer to the question, who's going to betray you? And they all said to John, you ask him because you're the closest one to him. And what a truth that was. John was the closest one to Jesus, not just in proximity. He was the closest one to Jesus because of intimacy. And by being the closest one to Jesus in intimacy, it is that one who can ask the questions that have never been asked. It is that one that can dare to ask. It is that one who can receive the the heartbeat of Jesus. It is that one that can hear and feel 
what Jesus hears and feels. It is that one. Which one? The one leaning in, the one taking advantage of the grace, taking advantage of the blood that by which we can come boldly, come in boldly and put your head on Jesus bosom. Come in boldly this year and lean into your identity as his beloved. And when you lean into your identity as his beloved, you will discover an intimacy as his beloved that you will not trade anything for. This is the one coming up out of the wilderness. My identity, your identity this year, identity is everything. To me, it is the birthplace of everything that God has for our lives to understand our, the core, our core identity, your core identity is found in he, Ephesians chapter one, verse 11 in the Message Bible. And it says this. It says for it is only in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Notice who we are results in what we're living for. Who we are is the birthplace of what we're living for. Who is the birthplace to what you want to know what to do in this new year? You want to know what to do with your life? It starts with who you are truly embracing as your core identity a son or daughter beloved of God. And when you grab a hold of your belovedness and when you say I'm coming up out of the wilderness and I am leaning into my belovedness, you are coming out of the dry seasons. You are coming out of the depression. You are coming out of the anxieties that have surrounded your heart. You are coming out of a place of fear. You are coming out of the place of punishment because God doesn't punish those whom he loves. Perfect love casts out fear because fear anticipates punishment. But we have fear cast out of us by the perfect love that Jesus has for us to allow us to the closest place, leaning in to hear his heart, leaning in to our core identity, which results in intimacy, which will launch you into your destiny. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. Who is the one that is coming up out of the wilderness? The one leaning on her beloved. You want to come out from the wilderness, lean into your belovedness. Come out of the wilderness, come out of the dry times, come out of the anxiety, come out of the fear, come out of the worry, come out of the depression, lean in, come out of the lack of purpose. You're not sure what to do with your life, not sure what to do with your year, not sure what to do in your family, not sure. Lean in. Lean in to your core identity. Lean in as his beloved. Lean in as the beloved of God. Lean in and know that you are the beloved. And every time the Bible says dearly beloved, it's not having a funeral. It's giving you an understanding of your core identity. You are his beloved. Lean into your belovedness this year. Lean into your belovedness this year and you will step into the next season of your destiny. Amen. Hallelujah. If you've never accepted Jesus into your life, if you've never accepted Jesus in your life and you don't want to leave here without him, put your hand up really high and I'm going to pray for you. You never accepted Jesus in your life. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? Put your hand up high. You want to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord today. Come on, put your hand up high. Now, everybody pray. Everybody pray this out loud on behalf of these people and everybody who raised your hand, pray this. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus into my life as my Savior. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God. God is on my side. I'm in the family of God. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. In Jesus name. Amen. Congratulations. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. If you prayed that prayer, make sure on your way out, you get one of these books, The Power of a New Life. And for those of you that prayed that prayer online, you can download this anywhere. Absolutely free. It's our gift to anybody that 
prayed that prayer. And for anybody that prayed online, it, you can download this anywhere in the world. Absolutely free. Lifechangerschurch.com slash salvation. You'll find it there. If you need prayer, it's a holiday. If you need prayer, come on up. We have prayer team members that will be praying for you and I will be praying for you next week as well. God bless you. I love you guys. Have a beautiful New Year's. Happy New Year, everybody. And we'll see you on Think Like a Champion. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful day. Come on up for prayer. Anybody that needs it.